On this week's Carrier Wrap, we speak with Federated Wireless CEO Iyad Tarazi to get an update on efforts to free up spectrum resources in the 3.5 gigahertz consumer broadband radio service band. All right, well, thanks for joining us on this week's uh, Carrier Wrap. Uh, I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. And uh, this week, we are joined by Ia Tarazi, who's the CEO of Federated Wireless, to talk a bit about uh, some of the company's work in the CBRS space and also just in general about how that, uh, how that space has evolved. So, Ia, thanks so much for joining us this week. We, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Very good. Uh, clearly, there's been a lot of momentum behind CBRS and shared spectrum, as we were uh, talking earlier. Yeah. Um, I would say part of the momentum is driven by uh, the conditional approval that we got from the FCC along with some others, which really means in the end of the day that the hundreds of pages in applications that we submitted uh, meets the hundreds of pages that the FCC has issued throughout the, the period of notices and regulatory process. Also, this is propelled by the fact that the WIN Forum, which is the standards body that did all the work on the standardization is, is mostly complete with what we need to be able to get started. So that's one set of momentum activities. Uh, a lot of activities also shifted to commercialization. We launched the CBRS Alliance with a group of others, including Qualcomm, Intel, Google, uh, Ericsson, Nokia, and Ruckus. And there's been a lot of momentum from six, seven companies to now in excess of 40 companies, including wireless carriers, which are obviously very important in the system, cable companies, tower companies, equipment makers, chipset makers, uh, WIS providers, even some of the uh, smaller providers in the rural areas as well that have maybe specialized capabilities. So there's been a lot of momentum across a whole bunch of areas in the ecosystem, regulatory standards, commercialization, and so on. Yeah, well, I guess maybe a bit on that, uh, on the certification from the FCC, I guess, how important was that for you guys and kind of for the whole process? It seemed like that really kind of solidified the work being done in terms of, uh, of this move towards CBRS management. Oh, absolutely. I mean, more than anything else, it demystified the process because the translation between a regulatory piece of work and what technically it means and what needs to be done usually is a very hard process. And the fact that we've all been working hard across the industry for the last two and a half years, I remember when the Wind Forum uh, Shared Spectrum Committee started two and a half years ago, I remember writing the, the charter on the Metro on my way to the first meeting where Preston and I started reorganizing sort of how do we go about it? And we had a lot of, a lot of support from the carriers and others uh, building it. And now we have you know, about 75 entities in the WIND Forum and multiple committees and standards that have been written and interfaces that people can test against and um, a set of requirements that people can get certified against. So I think that just speaks to uh, the idea that all, all of that work for two and a half years are suddenly visible to the industry through a conditional certification process say, ah, okay, now I understand. There's a way to translate what regulatory looks like in a technical way that has a path or certification. That's obviously a big piece of the, of the equation. Makes sense. And I guess on, on the, in terms of the interoperability aspect of this as well, I know there are a couple organizations looking to help uh, with the management of this, with the SAS programs. Uh, I guess how important has that work been and how, I, I guess, any sort of uh, struggles with the interoperability or how was that, that process kind of moved along? Uh, well, when the interoperability process started, it was a bit of a stop and start where we try and figure out what interoperability means because did it mean that we have to exchange all the data all the time? Do we have to uh, submit all of our data to everyone at any moment or how do we deal with data privacy? How do we deal with compliance? What about the requirements for us to be able to get the best of the best instead of sort of uh, degenerate into the worst answer from the worst test sort of thing. At least, these were at least the scenarios people were debating in the standards bodies. The uh, privacy issue, we've resolved uh, the standards process, how to interoperate, what kind of data we need to exchange, how, and uh, the Google team and the uh, access side of Google and ourselves went out and did a lot of work and back in December we demonstrated that we can implement the interoperability model 
that we can actually fulfill the standard. And uh, I can tell you, it was a big event for our engineers and their engineers all watching how it works. Um, it is two cloud systems talking together in the most advanced way you could think about it. And uh, we all felt very good about it because ultimately we want this to be an open system. Yeah, and again, it's a, pretty, it's a very complicated management system. I mean, you know, something that's kind of new to the industry, obviously the kind of the tiered access to all this, it, it's, there is a lot of moving parts, it seems like, or at least softer moving parts involved in this. So it does seem like that's been a, uh, again, a big, a big congratulations to you guys for working through all the processes to get the spectrum, like you said, it's been worked on for years and years now, to, to we're almost ready to have this, this spectrum uh, available to the commercial market today. Yeah, well, sort of, I always think about my job as two sides. There's the job that faces the people that are consumers of the spectrum. And we've done everything to make it simple. For example, it now takes about one to two days max for an OEM or an equipment maker to call us and say, I have a 3.5 radio and to be fully integrated with the SES. And in the old days when we used to design custom made small cells and have to deal with specific spectrum bands, that used to be a two year process with billions of dollars of upfront commitment. You know, on the other side, Behind sort of what the customer sees or what the integrator sees, a lot of complexity we had to work through. We had to automate all of the compliance rules. We had to figure out how to build sensors that in essence are able to look and see what the incumbents are doing, but do it in a way that's secure and in the right light way. And to be able to build all of that logic and be able to build uh, a live, constantly operating, always looking system to optimize the spectrum, but do it all behind the scenes. So in the end, all we're exposing is a set of APIs that people can look at and say, hey, I like these APIs. I see them in standards bodies. They're wide open. I really don't want to deal with all that complexity behind it. I just want results. So I, I always feel like there's two sides of the job. The one that deals with the complexity, which is all the partnerships that we built and all the industry alliances that we work together on and all the standards bodies um, and the regulatory and then the other side that said, hey, hey don't worry about it. It's a two-day process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Def it's two def messages. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like, too, I know coming out of the Mobile Congress event that we recently had, I know you guys had some more news out of there as well. I think uh, talking a bit about, I think it was software-defined spectrum controller as well, which seems to kind of indicate the further uh, kind of making this process, it seems like making it easier for everybody involved, it sounds like at least. Yeah, definitely. So we have had now a beta product for about a year okay. that people have been testing against. We now have 30 trials signed, have started or about to start. We've integrated about 15 uh, manufacturers or OEM or big equipment makers. Uh, the last few we uh, announced were Ericsson and Nokia, uh, into both of them individually going into Mobile World Congress. Uh, we had displayed our product in about eight different partner booths of all the different capabilities. We love the work that we're doing with Ruckus. We've done a lot of work with others as well. And, uh, and that continues. So based on all that feedback we've been getting, based on all of what people are trying out, multiple business models, everything from front hall, back hall, to small cells, to CRAN, to DAS upgrade or replacement, to you name it, indoor hubs and so on. Uh, what we've basically done is we've taken what the SAS is and what the ESCs, which are the listening devices, and put a wrapper around them, a set of APIs to simplify it. And at the end of the day, we decided the best way to actually describe this new type of product, because it is new in the industry, is just to call it a spectrum controller or a software-defined spectrum controller. So the best way I describe it is if you start with SDN, who manages the software, for the flows and the connectivity, and then you move up the chain all the way to NFB and all of the ways that we're looking to cloudify and simplify and software drive all the core network. If you just follow that one more layer towards spectrum and then you add to it now a software defined spectrum controller, then you're able to continue the move towards a completely cloud network that you have a lot of flexibility on. And so in the end of the day, what the Spectrum Controller is, it's got a SAS in the middle, it's got APIs towards the radio makers, but it's also got APIs to integrate with our SES and BSS system so nobody has to build another set of planning tools or management tools. It's got a set of APIs that now we're beginning uh, to prototype towards SDN and NFB implementations. So you can do you know, cloud uh, core and other implementations to simplify your network and ultimately has a set of automation tools where you can say, if I see these set of conditions on the spectrum, 
here's the rules I want to apply. I want to be able to add capacity if I see these conditions or tell me what you're seeing around me or how do I get the best non-line of sight capability. All of that wrapping around it is what the product is. It's all a set of APIs and a managed service solution to allow people to get into this product or this area quickly. So literally you can start in days and you can be a network provider in days now, which is really amazing compared to where we've been. Yeah, definitely. And again, it seems like too that this Spectrum band in particular, the 3.5 to 3.6 band, has gained so much attention recently too because it seems like it's lining up really well with uh, what people are doing in terms of small cells, indoor small cells, uh, a lot of talk around 5G as well. Uh, and there's also the uh, international interoperability of, of the Spectrum band as well too. So it seems like this band has become uh, almost like the hot new Spectrum band of, of kind of the, the network moving forward, uh, which, which I'm guessing will put a pretty good uh, stress test, I'm guessing, on what you guys are trying to do. I mean, obviously, if the systems don't work, we will know, rel- you know pretty quickly, but all the testing happening, at least, it sounds like you guys are working pretty aggressively to make sure that it is ready to handle what could be a lot of, a lot of uh, traffic happening across the, those Spectrum bands. Yeah, absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, Spectrum is about friends. If you either have a really big ecosystem and everybody loves it, or you've got nobody and nobody wants to touch it, there's sort of no in between. Uh, so the, the more the merrier, and I agree with you, that's, uh, you know, 3.5 or the CBRS band has a lot of advantages. One, it's large, um, it's um, placed properly for indoor and some of the outdoor. So the, the size of it, 150 megahertz, is really large enough to be able to do a lot of different applications. It's mostly empty which is really another big advantage versus using some of the existing, maybe uh, beginning to fill out type other spectrum ranges. And then on top of that, um, it does have now uh, near global harmonization, I would say from a chipset perspective. It's deployed in a lot of places in the world. And uh, you've seen going into Mobile World Congress, both Qualcomm and Intel announced what I would describe as gigabit LTE chipsets and components to support uh, this band. Uh, for LTE, plus uh, the path towards 5G for this band as well, both from uh, the, the new radio type concept as well from products that people are thinking about for backhaul and others. Um, in the rest of the world, uh, people look at 3.5 and say, okay, we've got 3.5 qualities and capabilities in our network, in our uh, countries, why don't we free them up to capitalize on the ecosystem that's building around CBRS? And so um, uh, someone's described to me that this is sort of the solution to the lack of harmonization. If you can't harmonize everywhere, then you can use shared spectrum to get 80, 90% access, which is better than having no one. And I think that concept probably will continue to grow. So yes, it's a popular band for the right reasons. We hope that it continues to grow. There are discussions about expanding it Mm -hmm. uh, above 3.7, and uh, I see tremendous potential for this band. Interesting. I guess, what sort of use cases do you expect initially to come from the use of the band? I mean, do you expect a lot of enterprises to tap into this, uh, operators to tap into it? I guess, who do you expect to be the big, the big initial users of, of the Spectrum and, and of the SaaS platforms? Yeah, I think the early deployments will be more like WISP deployments for underserved markets or even for regular WISP deployments. Uh, probably some of the earliest applications will be backhaul, point to point, starting in late 17 into 18. I expect that the mobility type products or applications, everything from densification in a carrier network, either a CRAN product or uh, products that look like typical small cell deployments to be around early to mid 18. And maybe around that time, we'll begin to see potentially some handsets as well for this band, at least that's what we're projecting. And then um, you'll begin to see new types of use cases. Uh, Neutral host is being discussed quite a bit which think of it as sort of a managed service for this type of harmonized band or this type of standardized band that others can use mm-hmm. and share and reduce the cost dramatically over DAS type solutions. We also expect, or at least we see right now, trials of people looking at taking components from the likes of Qualcomm and others and building private LTE solutions. Private LTE was a big part of the narrative in Mobile World Congress. Mm-hmm. and. That's, these are usually people like industrials or logistics or utilities or companies that are used to build their own uh, infrastructure that fits within their own logistics systems and analytics and so on. We're beginning to see a lot of these um, applications and interests probably a little bit more than we expected right now. So I would say uh, the type of enterprise customers that are coming in at this stage are people that own 
venues and big convention centers and would like to take as much of their internal traffic off of Wi-Fi so they can leave Wi-Fi to their customers. We're seeing some of that. We're seeing these components, businesses or industrial or private LTE. We're also seeing uh, the beginnings um, of trials and engagement around this managed service model or neutral host model as well. So all these sort of are, think of them as enterprise type solutions that would complement the carrier. And we're beginning to see some interest from the cable community as they look at it and see how could it be a solution for uh, entry into wireless? Could it complement an existing wireless solution? Could it be a solution for a home hub that uh, will do IoT applications like security and cameras and integration into the cable modem box or what other capabilities are? And we're also seeing interest from laptop makers to see could you use this sort of a private LTE? We did a demo with Dell and Polycom and Ruckus back in October last year where we showed sort of a private LTE at Dell World. We're using 3.5 compared to um, a Wi-Fi system. And clearly there's a, a quality and capacity advantage when you take a spectrum set that's open <laughs> and put an LTE network on it, clearly. Yeah, yeah no, I, I remember hearing somebody talk about a use case where an enterprise would be able to have access to almost 100 megahertz of spectrum on each level of a building, for instance. And you know, imagine what you could do with that much spectrum on an LTE network if you really provide a pretty compelling service for, you know, for what the enterprise is trying to do. So uh, a lot of potential there, it seems like. Yeah, definitely. The best way to think about spectrum is take the amount of spectrum multiplied by 10 to get sort of the, the potential for So 100 megahertz is about one billion, so maybe two or four times as much. Um, and so you're talking about the potential for gigabit services, especially now with the modules that have been announced by Qualcomm and Intel. And then you add to that a lot of the capabilities that people are building in the antenna side. You know, clearly um, that's coming for this band. I, had, I saw some demos at Mobile World Congress where using this band, CBRS, at one of the large equipment manufacturers showing how you can get to a gigabit download on it. Um, so people are already beginning to demo that. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And maybe a final question then, I guess, what sort of timing do we expect in the near term for the commercialization or, or when people can actually start uh, expecting the spectrum to be available through the various SaaS programs that are, that are out there? What do you think the, the timing would look like in the near term for that? So for us, uh, ultimately, it's about simplicity and availability for users. So um, in around the mid of 17, okay. maybe a little bit into third quarter is when we expect to have the certification complete. Um, that's around the same time we will launch our commercial product with all the capabilities in it, building on a year of beta that we've been working on so far. And then at the same time, we're beginning the process now of deploying sensors around the coasts in the continental U.S. so that we can get to 100% availability in continental U.S. for that spectrum. Because people still want New York and San Francisco, not just the Midwest. When they launch, they want to be able to get to a nationwide spectrum. Um, and that we expect, that process to expect uh, to complete by the end of 17. So we expect the commercialization to start third quarter, mm -hmm. um, into fourth quarter, and then obviously well into 18. That's uh, third quarter, fourth quarter of 17 is when we expect commercial launch. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, yeah, well, yeah definitely appreciate the insight. Obviously, a lot happening there with you guys. And uh, it's been a busy couple of years and uh, even busier, it seems, a couple of past few months, too. So uh, I know you guys are, uh, have a lot happening there, but uh, we definitely appreciate the insight on the topic. And as this continues to roll out, hopefully we can touch base again soon and get an update on what's happening with you guys. But uh, we definitely appreciate the time and insight today. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for watching this week's show. And make sure to check out our next carrier app when we take a look at the 5G fixed wireless panel I moderated at our recent Enterprise IoT event in Austin. Thanks for watching.